I do not want to suggest uh, uh, that Morocco is immune to what is happening. Of course, uh, we, we have the February 20 movement, but uh, uh, you know, we don't know what can happen in Morocco. Uh, I mean, who would have thought that people would go out against Ben Ali or Qaddafi uh, or, or uh, Bashar? So, uh, Morocco, yeah, it has done something that is uh, different, that is clearly better. And we, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, we are very lucky that we have avoided this bloodshed and things like that, even though the outcome is not necessarily ideal. But you never know what might happen in Morocco, and I do not mean to uh, suggest. Otherwise, I would fall within the uh, exceptionalism that I, I, I mentioned in the very beginning of this. So that's one point. Uh, the second point, which brings me to talk a little bit about, uh, in general, uh, uh, because this is the idea of outcomes, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of outcomes in Morocco. But then I think it would be uh, interesting to think about what kind of outcomes uh, in terms of the overall uh, what is uh, come to be called the Arab Spring or uprising or whatsoever. And I honestly here again like to, uh, I would hesitate to start uh, at this point uh, judging or uh, you know uh, what is happening in, in general in the area. Okay? Now uh, we have always history that can inform us here uh, because uh, uh, I think the classic reference to, uh, to revolutionary change, even though, uh, again, I'm not suggesting this, no, what you call in what happened with a revolution or uprising or spring, for me, the important thing is that the dynamics, the are dynamics. The classic reference, of course, of course when you speak about the, the French Revolution, well, the French Revolution has always been characterized by a number of historians as a, a sort of a pendulum swing, you know, uh, 1789, well, uh, and the French Revolution, in fact, it has a long history, you know, there is 1789, there is uh, the uh, July monarchy, the restoration, the July monarchy, there is uh, 1848, then there is 1878, of course, there is in between uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, but this is the French Revolution. So, for me, it changes what I would call cataclysmic changes, because these, for me, are the beginning of cataclysm in the long term, do require a long period of time. And I do not, and I am a student of history, I do not see necessarily as what the outcome is of not. So it would be very premature to start making quick judgment about what is happening and then the drawback, because it would, it would, it would be uh, also a historical and that uh, this is not how change occurred uh, in the block. So maybe the outcome of the, uh, uh, the uh, Egyptian revolution will be seen in a, a number of years from now. And uh, to, to, to judge what is happening in Egypt or, Sy or Syria or in uh, Syria or uh, in the very immediate, it's really for me difficult to, from this angle, because I like to see it. In, because if there is something that is clear is that uh, uh, I don't think there is any comeback, or there might be comeback, but then there is uh, that people have uh, realized, and this is again a big thing, is that they have got to rid. Uh, I mean, the ability of people to go to the street and say yes, I can make change. I can together. We can. This is something that that was unheard of in a number of Arab countries, but now people do believe in that. In fact, in Morocco more specifically, the number of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, activism has increased like, in a very big way. A lot of people are going to. And the same thing is happening in China. And for me, this is uh, very important and we have to look at it in the very long term. Again, like any kind of changes, uh, there will be uh, uh, drawbacks, there will be move, movement forward, uh, regressions, but I think there is a logic in the long, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, in the long term. <coughs> uh, this is why, for me, again, uh, and this can, uh, would do, uh, I think, honestly, also, uh, uh, part of the discourse that has started to emerge as in the context of this Arab Spring, is this rise of uh, Islamists, 
okay, and the threat of Islam. In a sense, I think uh, uh, this is also for me, in fact, I see it in the reverse. I see it as the beginning of the normalization of the Islamic parties, Islamist parties. In fact, I contributed a, a, uh, an article uh, on, in a book that is coming out on what is normalization of Islamist, uh, Islamist parties. So, and for me, what I mean by normalization is honestly, I think that uh, uh, the Islamist parties will gradually also become like any kind of parties and they will gradually uh, probably also start losing some of their legitimacy if they are unable to deal with, uh, with uh, the immediate problems. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, honestly, I can easily see that also the beginning in the long term, because I always see things in the long term, uh, of uh, the creation of the, the normalization of, polit of uh, Islamist political parties, so that they become part of the mainstream, and then they become, in a sense, also will be voted in and voted out. Okay? As long, of course, as the Islamist parties respect the rule of law, respect the democratic context once. So I think what we need to work on more and more is on the creation of this democratic institutional context that needs to, uh, uh, to be uh, established uh, in a, uh, institutionally, constitutionally, and in a number of different means. The Islamists do not threaten uh, me personally if uh, what threatens me is, is, is the, 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 in, the inexistence of the, the uh, democratic system. Uh, so uh, this is something also that I want to make point uh, about. Uh, I mean, we, uh, we, we do have uh, Christian Democrats, we do have uh, all sorts of... Uh, uh, and for me, uh, the, the reference to religion uh, as a, a way of engaging with political uh, with politics, it's something that is not uh, specifically Islamic. I can only mention Chartism in England, the civil rights movement in the United States. I can mention the uh, 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 the famous uh, Polish uh, 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 what's his, what's his name? The Solidarity movement. They all made reference to. Uh, to religion, and uh, 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 so there is no nothing specifically inherently modern Islamic. This is another interesting point because we tend to focus on uh, often Islam as this uh, uh, where religion is uh, uh, is uh, uh, related to politics. And these are all ideological constructs for me, and uh, I think we need to deconstruct them in the same way by the way we need to deconstruct secularism and what it means. Uh, 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 because one needs to make a distinction between ideological constructs of this and <coughs> what realities are real about. Uh, the last two points I would like to sort of uh, uh, so that we can open it for discussion is to uh, uh, read to you a sort of uh, uh, two, two aspects. One is a, uh, I would like to finish with a conclusion. Okay, which I would like to read. Uh, and I would like to speak a little bit about what I call competing logics in Morocco, in the Moroccan context. I see today two competing logics. Uh, and this is what I mean by these competing logics, which, which in fact framed constitutional reforms. Okay? So what are these two competing logics? The first logic behind the reforms, the constitutional reforms, uh, uh, are guided by the monarch and is naturally a char characteristic of the nature of the Moroccan political system in, in the sense that it is the monarchy that has historically all, made all the major decisions for the people because it is essential for its symbolic capital, or the symbolic capital of the monarchy, the monarchy has to constantly be seen as the prime mover. It's the monarchy that does it. The prime mover. As a potent political force, the monarchy alone is supposed to give, and it is not up to the people to take. 
when it comes specifically to the necessity of political change, this logic stresses, so what is this logic about? Evolutionary strategies, you know, we'll do things very, but it's not clear when, but, but it, it needs to be evolutionary. It shuns away from the immediacy of things, we need to do things now, okay? From this angle, from this logic also, uh, to push right now for democracy, from this logic, would mean uh, it, uh, it would become loaded with all sorts of stereotypes. Okay, what are these stereotypes? If you push for democracy, we will end up with the political instability. If you push for democracy now, there will be the specter of radical Islamic movement. This is the logic of the monarchy. If you put, we cannot put for democracy now because, quote unquote, a lack of cultural predisposition. And this is the typical Orientalist, in fact, and colonialist vision that the French or the British used to talk about us. No, modernity, uh, you are not predisposed culturally. Another reason for postponing the democratic project from this logic is that uh, people are not yet educated. Okay, this is the typical argument that is uh, presented. Uh, uh, another argument is the priority of economic growth. We need to work on the economy before we give people democracy. And another argument is the unreadiness of the, the political parties. Yet, we, as I clearly ex explained here, uh, it is the monarchy, it is the regime that has created this, uh, this kind of political parties. Of course, with the uh, uh, predisposition of the parties themselves. And finally, the centrality of the monarchy as being alone capable of guiding Morocco's future and guaranteeing its stability. Uh, uh, and, of course, as I mentioned the, uh, here, the reference to the Moroccan exception in this logic becomes a very, uh, 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 very relevant. It is part, as I mentioned, of Mahzanian logic. But what is interesting is that this Mahjanian logic has been appropriated by the dominant political parties. So you will hear people from the left, from the Islamists, saying exactly this kind of uh, uh, argument in order to postpone uh, uh, this, the, the uh, democratic project. Um, this is clearly, uh, for me, relates to the fact that there is a lack of uh, alternative, uh, as I mentioned. And uh, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, this, this discourse is being appropriated and it makes it uh, very difficult. It is clearly a discourse that is backward looking. And what I mean by backward looking in the sense that it sees the present at least as better than the past. So, well, at least this is better than what we had before. And for me, this is not the kind of progressive group that looks at ideals and puts ideals in front of them in order to reach. Uh, and it is within, as I mentioned to you, the orbit of Mahzen. Uh, now, as I told you, it used to be in the old, uh, uh, in the 60s and 70s that uh, political scientists when they studied Morocco they made this distinction between uh, Mahzen and political parties and I honestly today am unable to make this, uh, this uh, distinction because I see more and more the parties as becoming if you will more Mahzenized than the Mahzen themselves in fact there is a political scientist who studied, who, who tried to see how uh, this system, Mahzanian system has been appropriated from within the political party themselves. Hence, 
you have the, the leader of the party who is unwilling to give up, uh, would like to find always ways to stay in power within the party. Okay? So you have this. On the other hand, you have the other kind of logic, uh, informed, uh, uh, which, which has informed the reforms in Morocco, is in a way more forward-looking, and uh, it clearly understands that constitutional reforms, uh, if they have to, to, to take place, if they had to take place, they had to, take the, to think about the relationships of parts of the parts. Because structurally, the relationship of powers between the political parties and all other political actors is an imbalance. Hence, the outcome would reflect that imbalance. And in order to create a, a, a meaningful democratic constitution, you have to, uh, uh, to deal with this imbalance. Okay? And in many ways, this logic still views the constitutional reforms not as the people's constitution, but as the regime's constitution. And it is very interesting if you read the whole constitution, the new constitution, the 2011 constitution, there is not a single reference to the people. Only one. One reference in the whole to the people. Because there is reference to the sovereignty of the nation. This is what is repeated, but not the idea of the people. And this is, in fact, very revealing about the fact that this is, for me, a regime's constitution, not a people's constitution. Uh, and this is uh, clearly uh, something that one has to uh, think about. Uh, let me uh, conclude. While the monarchy is still very popular in Morocco, the February 20th movement has become indicative of a growing disparity between the public's dreams and aspirations for the establishment of a real democracy and the political parties and ruling elites politics of consensus, as I explained here, that cling to the premise that the existing institutional structures are still needed to pursue gradual reforms and maintain the stability of the country. In the absence of a counter discourse and other political alternative to put into question the monarchy's dominant position and prerogatives, it might be possible that a serious economic crisis of governance or the economic crisis would create the condition for major social movements and would force democratic change in a way that is more revolutionary than the reformist agenda that was attached to the February 20th movement. As I told you, even though it existed, the February 20th movement never said down with the regime. It really wanted reform. But uh, this is the point. So despite their relative failure to mobilize very large numbers of Moroccans and create major problems for the regime, the protesters are still going to the street even during the holy month of Ramadan that we are going through. Uh, 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 and still they are uh, uh, making similar demands, uh, and these demands uh, might resonate and do resonate uh, uh, with large numbers of people. Especially if the people start feeling more economic crises, if they start seeing that these constitutional reforms have not changed their daily lives and have not affected them in any meaningful way. Now, if we believe that democracy is acquired and it is not given, then it is perhaps fair not to expect a liberal monarch such as King Mohammed VI to give more of his power than what he has uh, actually been able to do. Because honestly, he has done, uh, but democracy for me is not something that is given. 
he ha uh, I, I do not expect the monarch to give more of his power because democracy for me is something that is acquired. The constitutional reforms fall short of the demands of the February 20 movement, but the Moroccan political party must bear a major responsibility for not taking advantage of the historical moment and stepping out of the politics of consensus as they are guided by Mahzanian love. And I would like to stop here. Uh, and so uh, open the question uh, again for a question. Uh, what's your vision? Is it the constitutional monarchy of the British or the Spanish, uh, Dutch side? Mm. Well, uh, I think the, the, the key principle here is, uh, and I haven't dealt away with a lot of detail with the constitution because uh, of the time constraint, uh, but, uh, but uh, a, uh, the, one of the, the slogans of the February movement is a monarch uh, that uh, uh, rules but does not govern. A monarch qui règne, mais qui ne. Uh, yes. So it's it's along uh, it's along the, uh, the Spanish the uh, you know basically not to uh, to have uh, uh, may, uh, this major executive power because as it is the, the new constitution, I mean that one of the basic I mean two basic notions that are totally uh, not present in the new constitution. One is the basic idea of separation of powers. Because the, the monarch concentrates all the power, military, religious, uh, and you can read it through. So, uh, so this is a very basic thing. Another basic aspect of any uh, seemingly democratic system is the issue of accountability. No accountability, even though there is speak, uh, I mean they speak about accountability, but accountability stops at the level of the head of the, the uh, government, not the monarch. Uh, so, uh, and there are other major uh, issues. So for example, one aspect, be, uh, you know, because there is a constitution, but then this constitution is supposed to be supplemented by what we call in legal uh, constitutional law, uh, organic laws, the loi organique. And it is in this process that there are also problems that you can work with uh, and reduce the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the effectiveness of the... So there are, after the constitution, there are a number of law organic that have emerged. And one of the latest I just received uh, about one hour ago is co concerning the key positions uh, that, uh, that the, the monarch alone uh, you know, has the, the major uh, position. And by the way, in the constitution, the monarch can still do away with the parliament, do away with the minister, do away with any minister. You can read that through the constitutions and through the clauses. So otherwise, the whole uh, parliament can be <laughs> revoked by the monarch. There is the issue of, as I mentioned in the, my talk, about the, the fact that the, the speeches of the monarch cannot be debated. Uh, there is the issue about the dahirs that I wrote, the codes that can be uh, promulgated by the. So, uh, now, I do not want to give a, um, a pessimistic view. Of course, there are some interesting things related to uh, human rights and uh, the multicultural component of Moroccan society. For the first time, there is a reference to. Uh, to uh, different uh, cultural expressions, uh, the uh, religious also uh, freedom, but then there is the idea, the problem of apostasy. Otherwise, that the Moroccans who, uh, do, uh, who decide to convert to another religion are still can be put in jail. And, uh, and so there are these other issues. While there are some positive changes, uh, I think one of them is giving more power, a little bit more power to the head of the government, you know. But it is generally limited. So, so uh, you have to really read the, uh, you know, <coughs> this clause and then you go to another clause because uh, it is replete with ambiguities and uh, you have to really be an expert to start looking at the contradictions. Uh, 
so what what is given to you uh, through the door is thrown through the uh, windows. <laughs> well, there are some positive uh, 